Good morning. This is so fun uh, for me to be here with y'all because I was supposed to get here at like two o'clock in the afternoon yesterday and my flight kept getting delayed and getting delayed and getting delayed. So I got here at about two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so if I say anything bad, <laughs> you can just blame my lack of sleep. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit not okay in the head. Um, as Dan said, my name is Caitlin, and what he didn't say is that I spent most of my time thinking about faith and politics. I'll just let that sit for a minute. Everyone can freak out. Um, I am working on my doctorate. I've written a couple of books about faith and politics. I go and speak at churches and Christian schools. So I spend all of my time thinking about Christianity and politics, and I love it. It's weird to me that other people don't love it. <laughs> um, and I've learned people get a little nervous when I show up. Um, they're a little nervous about talking about politics. Um, let's just take a deep breath together, shall we? It's gonna be okay. It's gonna get a little weird. It's gonna get a little hard, but it's gonna be okay. We're gonna talk about our political life today through some of the words in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. There are a lot of verses. I know I've listened to some sermons. Dan's already talked about this. There are a lot of verses in this sermon that we've already kind of pulled out of the sermon and used in our everyday life. You've probably, you've already covered some of them. That line about a city upon a hill. Uh, you remember that one? Jesus calls the people of God the salt of the world, the light of the world, and then he says they're a city upon a hill. And that one phrase gets used in our political life in America. Lots of politicians have used it to describe America as a city on a hill, even though that's not what Jesus was talking about. Ever since Ronald Reagan made it a big part of his presidential campaign and his presidency, we've used this one line from the Sermon on the Mount, a city upon a hill, so much in our politics that in 2016, a presidential candidate said, we're still Reagan's shining city on a hill. So now this phrase isn't even Jesus's anymore. <laughs> it's Ronald Reagan's. It's kind of like those Bible verses that get embroidered on pillows or posted on social media. We have those verses that we just kind of hear a lot and get too familiar with. And we have verses like this in our political life. And I research how the Bible has been used in American history as part of my thinking about faith and politics. And let me tell you, we have always cherry-picked weird verses and used them in our political life. Honestly, the only difference throughout our history is that we used to use more obscure references because we knew the Bible better. So, for example, in the Revolutionary War era, people used to invoke something called the Curse of Miraz, which I know you're all familiar <laughs> with the Curse of Miraz. I'll tell you what it is in case you're not. This was a reference to Deborah's song in Judges, and she curses the town of Miraz for not coming to the aid of God's people in battle. So people would use this against each other. If you weren't sufficiently on board with the revolution, it was like the Curse of Miraz be against you. And we couldn't use this today, mostly because no one would know what we were talking about, but we have little verses like this that we pull out to use against someone, right? The passage today has one of those. We're going to be in Matthew 7, which, as Dan said, starts, do not judge, or you too will be judged. We know this one. We've heard this maybe on social media and everyday interactions. Jesus said not to judge. Don't judge me. I won't judge you. Everyone's good, right? Right? Sometimes we like this, right? If we're doing something and we don't want someone to judge us, it's like, ah, oh, Jesus said, don't judge. If we would like to judge someone, we like it less. <laughs> if we think we have a good judgment about something that's really wrong and we want to call it out. And I have found that it's verses like this that can be particularly dangerous because we're so familiar with them that we struggle to hear them fresh, to be surprised by them, to be convicted. We can't help but be familiar with these verses, but we can try and get into this passage with a little bit more of an open mind to see what God might say to us, something that might surprise us, something that might even discomfort us. I like to joke as someone who studies faith and politics that I think every verse in the Bible is about politics. <laughs> and I'm mostly joking, but then every time I come to preach a new sermon, I'm like, wow, there it is, it's politics again. So I'm warning you in advance, here together we will discover a word for our public lives as well as our personal lives, a word for how Christians might engage in politics this year from Jesus. So I'm just going to read the whole passage and then we'll get into it. This is Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. 
If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. I love that this passage starts with a verse that we're super familiar with and ends with a weird one that we don't know what to do with. It's like, I know the do not judge part. I don't know what's going on with the pigs and the dogs. We'll get to that later, I promise. But let's start with this very first part. Do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So let's start with the obvious. The word judge is a tricky one. It has an almost universally negative connotation in our cultural context. Judging someone is to look on them with condescension, to make an unfair verdict on their behavior. And it's not just that we don't like the word judging, we don't like the concept of judging, right? We don't like the idea that other people might make judgments about my behavior, right? You do you, I'll do me, we're fine. Live your own truth. As long as I'm not hurting anyone, you know, you don't get to tell me what to do. You don't even get to tell me that what I'm doing isn't right to you. But the word judgment, both the Greek word that's used here and our English word judgment, has a whole range of meanings that aren't just negative. Evaluate, discern, decide. It can have a judicial connotation, like when a judge decides on a matter officially. But here it seems to have a broader meaning that can include thoughtfully considering a matter in order to make a decision, a judgment about what to do. This is why context is so important. Can Jesus really mean we're not supposed to judge at all? We're not supposed to thoughtfully consider the situation and come to a judgment? Of course not. Already in this sermon, he has made some judgments he expects his followers to also make about murder and adultery and mistreating people and how to use your money. And he's about to, just after this section, talk about making judgments between true and false prophets, between true and false disciples. Jesus is all about judging if what it means is careful discernment, evaluating situations and coming to good conclusions. So what could he mean here? Well, the rest of this section gives us a pretty good idea. In the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. One of my seminary professors loved to say that the best Bible reading tip he could give you was that after verse 1 comes verse 2 which is a way of saying, read the next thing. <laughs> in this case, if we're like, don't judge, what does he mean? In the way you judge, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So the issue is not making judgments, but making judgments against others you wouldn't want made of you. And here's what's so cool about the Bible, right? When you have a question, when there's something that sounds contradictory, when there's something that's confusing, you can see where else in this wild and wonderful book can help make sense of this for me. There are a couple other places in Scripture that specifically talk about judging in a similar way. In Romans 2, Paul says that we are without excuse when we pass judgment on others because we do the same things we judge others for. But then in chapter 14, he gets a little more specific, Romans 14. He says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This passage makes more explicit what's a little more implicit in the sermon. Do not judge others unfairly because you are not the judge. God is the judge. We are not. Think about it. Jesus has just spent the majority of his sermon telling people all about how to live a faithful life, and it probably is starting to sound pretty hard, right? Blessed are the poor and the meek and the persecuted. It's not enough to not murder. You can't even get angry and yell at your brother. It's not enough to not cheat on your spout. You can't even think about it. You can't retaliate against people who harm you. You have to love your enemies If you're fasting, you can't even brag about it to people. You're not supposed to love money when it's so easy to love. You're not even supposed to worry. I mean, I'm imagining people listening here. At this point in the sermon, they're starting to get pretty uncomfortable. And what I've learned in church, maybe you have experienced this in church, is that if I start to get a little uncomfortable with the sermon, if I start to feel a little convicted, my brain does this really helpful self-protective thing, and I start to think, that's actually about someone else. (laughs) This is a great message for my friend. (laughs) I like to imagine the disciples hearing this sermon and knowing how the disciples can be. They're starting to think, wow, this is a really good word for Peter. Or Judas really needed to hear that part. Or I bet Jesus hates it when Andrew does that one thing. And Jesus, because he loves them so much and he loves us so much, says don't do that. 
right? We're right at the point in the sermon when you might start to point fingers at other people and say, I know someone who does that thing Jesus just said he doesn't like. And Jesus stops and says, don't do that. This is really hard in our political life. Not only do we want to wield the Bible like a weapon against people who disagree with us, cherry-picking verses to support our politics and other verses to condemn other people's, this is so true in politics that we are constantly tempted to usurp God's position on the throne. We want to be the judge. We want to think we are all-knowing that we know exactly what would fix the world, that we stand above all the political messiness and can make perfect judgments from on high. If we were in charge, we like to think we'd fix everything. And Jesus is reminding us here not only that our judgments might come back to bite us, but that this temptation to try and sit on God's throne and be the judge is wrong. It kind of reminds me of when I was fresh out of seminary or fresh out of college, excuse me, just starting seminary, I was working at a church in children's ministry, and I feel like every time I preach anywhere, I just have to give a shout out to children's ministry. <laughs> you should volunteer for it. Someone back there in the church office is like waiting for someone else to come help with it. It's the best thing that you can do for your faith, I think. I was working in children's ministry, and I was like 22 years old, didn't know what I was doing, and one Sunday morning, one of our best volunteers got stuck in Dallas traffic. So I had to go get thrown into this room with 25 three-year-olds, if I'm being honest, it was probably like 10 three-year-olds. <laughs> but in my mind, it was 25 three-year-olds, and it was chaos. There was like markers on the wall and goldfish crunched into the carpet, and there was like baby dolls thrown around like a crime scene, and I was just like, I, I'm a child, so like where is the grown-up that will fix this? It's not me. And I tried really hard. I got into that room, and I like put my foot down, like I'm in charge. These kids laughed in my face. It was bad. And after like 10 or 15 hours or minutes or what, it was a long time, our faithful volunteer, this grandmother who'd been teaching for years, she was so good. She comes in, and let me tell you, when she stood in that doorway, the room stopped. Because these little three-year-olds, they know who's in charge. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was her. And I think this is, strangely enough, a picture of our political life. We are running around like wild children yelling at each other, fighting over the wrong things, destroying the room that we've been given to live in. Some of us are drawing on the wall and then we're turning and pointing our finger at someone else and saying, she's drawing on the wall. And then some of us are even like me, coming in and stamping our foot and being like, I'm gonna bring some order into this and we are not in charge. And Christians, we have been given incredible insight into the world. Because of the revelation of God in this text, because of the guiding of the Holy Spirit, we have resources to share with the world, including in our political life. We have great gifts that help us make wise judgments, the kinds of judgments Jesus talks about throughout this sermon. But here he reminds us that even our best efforts at faithful judgments are pretty much like me stamping my foot. They're good, they're not perfect, and we are not the judge. And we go most disastrously wrong in all things, but especially in our political lives, when we try to usurp the throne, when we start to think we can make perfect, all-knowing judgments like God can. You might have heard someone say recently, this is the most important election in our lifetime. I'm not that old, and I have heard that like four times already. <laughs> this is the most important election in our lifetime. We are not the judge of that. We do not know. We are finite creatures that don't know the future. Or maybe you've heard someone say, you can't be a Christian and vote for that person. Or you can't be a Christian and have that political position. We don't know. We are not the judge. We don't know people's hearts. We don't know the judgment God will make. We don't know with that level of certainty what the right way to vote is. We can make wise judgments in politics. We can think about how Christians should vote, what issues we should prioritize, what we should think about certain policies. We should talk together about these important questions, learn from one another. But we have this tendency to slip from working towards faithfulness, making the best judgments we possibly can, into making confident judgments we can't make, into pretending we are God and we know all. This is a really important theological point about politics I need to make using two very technical words, I'm sorry. Politics for Christians is always provisional and contingent. 
provisional and contingent. We try our best. We do the best that we can. We make the best decisions possible. We're open to changing our minds, to trying something, to address a problem, and then realizing that our efforts failed. <laughs> we wanted to serve these people, and we actually hurt them. OK, we try again. We go back to the drawing board. Politics, for us fallen humans, is never the final word. It's always us trying to fix problems in our communities, inevitably trying again when we don't get it right the first time. There are things taught to us in scripture we can hang our hats on. This book tells us, thus saith the Lord, right? God has spoken. How we apply what God has said to our political life will always be imperfect. It'll always be up for revision because God is the judge and we are not. Okay, now let's move on to the next part where Jesus tells a joke. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you Jesus isn't funny. Uh, we are so accustomed to hearing this weird little illustration he gives that we forget that people probably laughed at the time. Like he was trying to be funny. This is probably a joke. This is what he says. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is expanding on this point he's already made about judging people. Don't do it if you aren't able to see your own sin. Every time I hear this verse, I once again think about a time that I was vividly shown a plank in my own eye. I was in my last semester of seminary, so I knew everything. <laughs> I had learned all the things you have to know, and I thought I was very smart. And I'm in my last semester, and I had forgotten, kind of, there had been a scheduling conflict. I hadn't taken this one intro class that everyone's supposed to take. So I have to go back and sit with these newbies, you know, who don't know anything that I know. And I'm sitting in this intro to church history class with all these first year students, and there's one day that this first semester student raises his hand, makes a comment that I think is the dumbest comment. <laughs> I truly am like, this is a ridiculous, how have you not read the stuff we've all read? How are you possibly saying? And in that moment, the Holy Spirit brought to my mind, as vividly as if it was a movie, me sitting in my first semester class in that same classroom, raising my hand and making, truly, y'all, the same exact comment. I truly had said the same exact comment. I had forgotten it for four years, and the Holy Spirit brought it to mind. And I thought, what am I doing how did I get so pompous and arrogant? How do I not see that I have done the exact same thing? I have made the same exact mistake this person has made, and yet I am treating them with such derision. Again, I think this story describes something incredibly common in our political life, especially for Christians. We rush into political life armed with good theology and all of our supposed righteousness, and we're ready to tell the world what's wrong with it. We're often so convinced of our own goodness, we don't even realize that our sinfulness is keeping us from seeing rightly. So this is what we need. We need to see ourselves rightly in order to serve the world. We should serve the world. We should go out from this church more equipped by the songs we sing and the story we hear proclaimed to help bring glimpses of the coming kingdom of God to our communities, but we will fail at that, often spectacularly, if we think we are the good guys who will always do it right. This has been true over and over again in our own history. In the late 1800s, remember, I'm a history nerd here, but trust me, this stuff is interesting. In the late 1800s, a lot of Christians became convinced that they needed to bring God's kingdom to earth. They believed something true, that God graciously allows us to participate in bringing his kingdom to earth, and they wanted to do it in tangible ways. So they took care of orphans, and they fought for protections for workers, and they served the poor, and they built hospitals. But they also believed too strongly in their own goodness. One of the popular preachers in this, moment, in this movement, called the Social Gospel Movement, he was so confident in the work he was doing that he preached a sermon where he basically said, I'm paraphrasing him here, Jesus had such a good Sermon on the Mount, and it's such a shame he couldn't get it done in his time but we can make it happen here and now. <laughs> Which is a wild thing to say about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was incapable, but we'll, we'll pick up where Jesus left off. This pastor and many other folks involved in this movement saw something true about what this Sermon on the Mount says to us. We get to participate in what God is doing on earth. 
We can seek justice and show mercy in our communities. We can love our neighbors so much that we get involved in politics on their behalf rather than just fighting for our own interests. But what they missed was the sin in themselves. They saw sin out in the world. Many of us are really good at seeing it out in the world, but they didn't see it in themselves. They pointed out problems in the world, but they missed the biases in themselves. They weren't in community with the poor they wanted to serve, so they never asked the poor what they wanted. They wanted to fix the world, but they weren't paying attention to their own need for God's grace. They thought, we can do it without dependence upon God. And I fear a lot of Christians in politics today are doing the same thing on both ends of the political spectrum. We are overly confident in our judgments about what to do politically, as we've said, and we're overconfident in our own goodness. We think we can rush in with all the best ideas and fix everything, and we won't make any mistakes, and we won't have mixed motives, and we won't let pride or greed or hate affect us the way they affect other people. But they do. Jesus doesn't tell this funny story to keep people from helping other people see their faults and sins. He even gives the reason for taking the plank out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. It's not just that it's wrong to call out other people when you are also at fault. It's that you will be unable to help them if you can't see yourself clearly, if you don't deal with your own stuff, if we don't deal with our own stuff. We have a lot of great gifts to give the world. We have great teachings about turning the other cheek and forgiving one another and being patient and slow to speak. We have teachings in this book about how humans were intended to live, what human communities should look like, how to take care of the poor, address the sins of our leaders. The whole Old Testament in particular is full of colorful stories of politics, done well, done poorly. I want us to give these gifts to the world to help us shape our communities but we will not be able to give those good gifts if they're always used as a weapon against other people instead of as a tool to see the sin in ourselves first. So now we come to the last part of this passage, the hardest part. (laughs) Biblical scholars are actually pretty confused about this passage in general, so thanks, Dan. (laughs) Um, This whole section, there's usually like an aside and a commentary that's like, we don't know what to do with this part. It's kind of confusing. It's hard to figure out how it really flows together, but this last line, they really don't know what to do with. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. (laughs) Um, Who are the dogs and the pigs? What is the sacred thing or the pearl? And what does this have to do with the last few verses about judgment? It's almost like Jesus just like got, you know, lost in thought for a moment and went, oh, I have another thing, dogs, pigs, pearls. I don't know what to do with that. I tell you that the scholars and many preachers argue about this and are confused about this for a reason. First, because I think it's a good reminder that even people who study the Bible for a living, myself included, have things that confuse us, (laughs) that we have to go to our communities and to the Holy Spirit and get help with because we don't know what they mean. And it's also because, I want to note this, because verses like this can make us feel like maybe this whole wild and confusing book isn't worth getting into, right? You come to a verse like this and you're just like, maybe we're just done. I can't do this anymore. But I have learned something over the years of studying the Bible every single time, and I promise you this is true, every single time that I come to a passage that is confusing or seems contradictory or seems bad, right? You know those passages where you're like, I don't think God looks good in this one or I don't know what to do with this, or I think this is telling me to do something I think is wrong. Every single time I come to a confusing or seemingly bad passage and I do the work of studying it, of asking questions, of asking the Holy Spirit to help me, of reading a bunch of books, of going to really smart people, every single time, God is better than I thought. This story is even better than I thought. It's even more beautiful than I thought. So I think there is still something here for us, even though it's confusing. So Jesus has just told us to pump the brakes a little bit on our judgments, reminded us that if we think this sermon is another tool for us to use to wield against other people, we're wrong. And then after cautioning us about how we might be the reason not to judge someone else, now he says the other person might be the reason not to judge them. Our own sinfulness, our own hypocrisy might be the reason we don't judge others but their hearts might be the reason too. 
both dogs and pigs were seen as unclean animals. Uh, when you read dogs in scripture, don't think like cute puppies. <laughs> That's almost never what it means. It usually is like wild dogs, vicious animals. So Jesus says not to give sacred and valuable things to these wild and unclean animals. Jesus has been talking the whole sermon about something sacred and valuable, the coming kingdom of God. And here, after telling the crowds not to use the good news of the kingdom as a weapon of judgment against other people, now he tells the crowds not to give this message of the coming kingdom to those who will not receive it, to those who will trample the message and attack the messenger. A similar message comes up a few other times in Matthew's gospel. Later, Jesus will tell his disciples to shake the dust off their feet if they go to a town to share the gospel and they're not welcomed and the message isn't received. A few chapters later, the disciples come to Jesus and they're like, do you know the Pharisees are saying bad things about you? (laughs) And Jesus is like, let them be. It's fine. Jesus is not saying here that we shouldn't share the gospel because we're worried people will reject it or reject us. He's not saying don't share the treasures of the kingdom with people who don't deserve it. None of us do. He's saying that this gift, this gift we have of being able to judge between good and evil might not make sense to people who are rejecting the gospel. We might take the plank out of our own eye and want to help someone with a speck in theirs, but they're not willing to see it. They might even resent that we pointed it out. They might trample over this gift we want to give and attack us. This, once again, says something to our political life. We've already said Christians have great gifts to offer our political world. We have truths in this book that could shape our communities, truly good gifts that give us insight into how God created humans and how he wants human communities to function. But there are times when these gifts, these insights into right and wrong, good and evil, will not be well received. And Jesus here does not say, if they trample your gift and attack you, attack them back. Force them to accept this gift. Fight them and win and take over so you can make sure everyone accepts the judgment you want to make. No. He says, don't give it to them if they don't want it. In this sermon and throughout Matthew, Jesus seems uninterested, honestly, in the people who hate his message and hate him. Let them be, he says. It says a few chapters later in Matthew that he saw the crowds harassed and helpless and has compassion on them. He loves them, even when they're not accepting the message. He wants the best for them, even if they don't want it. But then he tells his disciples, if their message is met with hate, shake the dust off your feet. This is a word for our political life as well. At various points in Christian history, Christians have been so convinced we have the truth and we need to share it that we have enforced it with force. We can fall into that temptation today too. But here and elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus makes clear some people will not accept this good gift. And so we pray and we work faithfully and we hope in the return of Christ to make all things new, doing our best here and now, and knowing not everyone will accept it. Our political life as Christians is not about knowing everything, (laughs) judging everything, ignoring our own sinfulness to tell the world what's wrong with it, or forcing the gospel on people. It's about love. Christians engage in politics as an act of love for our neighbors. As we are already in the chaotic midst of an election year, a lot of things will be said about Christian politics. What we should believe, what we should vote for, how we should act, how we should represent Jesus in public. And this is what I think must be said first and foremost. We engage in politics not to win a battle or save the world, someone's doing that already, (laughs) or force people to accept the gospel. We engage in politics as an act of love for our neighbors. And the rest of the sermon that's left gives us instructions on how to do this. You ask God for help. You pray. You admit your dependence. We struggle to discern between false and true prophets to listen to them. We build our house on the firm foundation of Jesus's instructions, and we practice them. There will be great temptations this year. You might have already faced them. (laughs) To judge people harshly and unfairly, to forget our own sin and point fingers at other people, to want to coerce people into believing the things that we believe. But the words of Jesus here, 
here in the Sermon on the Mount and throughout the rest of the Gospels point us back again and again and again to love. And figuring out what love looks like in terms of policies and who you vote for and voting and protesting and calling elected officials, it is hard. We need each other to help us discern. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us. What does love look like now? But we keep training our attention back on love. We love our neighbors enough to research candidates that we might never really interact with, but that affect our neighbors. We love enough to spend time in our neighborhoods to learn from people we disagree with. We love enough to be curious and ask questions instead of jumping to disagree and fight. We love enough to lay down our own desires for the sake of our neighbors. Jesus' words here are not a reason for us to disengage from the world. They're a reason for our way of engaging in the world to make no sense to anyone unless Jesus Christ lived and died and rose from the dead. Let's do politics with the truth of the gospel in mind. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you for a hard passage with some strange things in it. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to think well together about what you would have us do in our political lives. I thank you for opportunities in our neighborhoods to love well. God, I pray, I pray that you would bring to mind for each of us someone to love, something to do with that love, some way to respond in our neighborhoods practically. And God, I pray you would fill us so strongly with the truth of the gospel that we wouldn't be tempted towards any of the temptations described here, that we would know so surely who we are in you, that we can love with abandon, that we can love even when it get, gets us mixed up in politics, when it's confusing, when it's hard. God, I pray that you would guide us, protect us, keep us trained on love for those made in your image. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.